There's no hiding it at this point. Justin Trudeau has gone completely insane. He's got extra taxes to fight climate change as if taxing people in Canada is going to solve weather and solve hurricanes. And then in addition to that, he's taxed that tax, which it doesn't sound like that makes any sense because it doesn't make any sense. But Justin Trudeau somehow has found a way in his mind for it to make sense. So a lot of Canadians and just people around the world are fed up with him. And you would think that it would just end there. But above and beyond that, the Senate here in Canada also finds Justin Trudeau absolutely disgusting. And just his incompetence is it's just so obvious. It's so obvious that Justin Trudeau has no idea what the hell he's doing. Welcome back to another video, everybody. Before we get into it, I want to encourage you to give a like and subscribe if you haven't yet already. It really helps grow the channel as well as remind you that you can get your exclusive I Did Not See That Coming sticker down in the description or the pinned comment below. We're going to be taking a look at a very awesome conservative senator absolutely destroying Justin Trudeau on his incompetence. And it's like, hey, man, none of this makes any sense. Like, like. It doesn't matter how you look at it. It doesn't make any sense. And so brace yourself because this is going to be pretty entertaining. Here we go. Senator Gold, as Prime, the, as Prime Minister Trudeau shows no sign of understanding how his inflationary carbon tax is hurting families all across our country, it's clear that he is not interested in listening to Canadians or even to one of his own members of parliament. Senator Gold, a Liberal MP from Newfoundland and Labrador, Ken McDonald said this about the carbon tax in an interview earlier this month, and I quote, we're punishing the rural areas of our country and the most vulnerable people in our society. He's right, leader. Why doesn't the Prime Minister understand this? Is it because he's never had to worry about how to feed himself or wonder how he'll pay for a roof over his own head? Is that why he won't axe the tax? Thank you for your question. Uh, no, the, the short answer is no. And the longer answer is that the Prime Minister, and indeed this government, has shown uh, considerable uh, understanding and, uh, more importantly, taken action uh, to address the difficult circumstances that Canadians uh, have been facing and continue to face across this country. And in that regard, although I, as, as I've said on many occasions in this chamber, and it bears repeating, the tax on carbon, on pollution, is one of a suite of measures designed to, and a mark, is, is one of a suite of measures and the most efficient market-driven measure uh, to ensure that we can make the transition uh, from our current economy to a cleaner and more sustainable economy for the benefit of uh, our generation and future generations to come. Senator Platt? Well, obviously you've gone to the scale, same school of economics as Justin Trudeau. The budget doesn't balance itself, even if you and he believe that it does. Leader, I will put this on the record because it's important. Liberal MP Ken McDonald said a constituent called him and said she couldn't afford home heating oil anymore. And I again quote, she said, I go around my house with a blanket wrapped around me. And she said, the only time I get to have beef or chicken is if my niece or nephew invites me out to Sunday dinner. This, Senator Gold, is as a result of your regressive carbon tax. The MP tells this story to everyone he meets in the Trudeau government. And again, I quote, he said, at first, some people said to me, like, there's nobody living like that. And I said, if you don't think people are living like that, you're not living in the real world. I would suggest that to you and Prime Minister as well, Senator Gold. If you don't believe people are living like that because of this, you're not living in the real world. Leader, I agree the Prime Minister is not living in the real world. A year ago, 39 members of his cabinet, 39 members of his cabinet, spent over $46,000 on catering for a three-day trip to discuss affordability. $46,000 to discuss affordability. Is that an example of living in the real world, Senator Gold? Yes or no? Senator Gold? The story that the Liberal MP uh, 
uh, recounted, uh, unfortunately, is a story of hardship that many Canadians uh, could recount. Uh, it is not, however, correct. <clears throat> it is not, however, correct, whatever the perception is, to attribute it uh, to uh, the tax, uh, any more so or less so than it would be to attribute to one factor, whether it's world oil prices, whether it's other uh, 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 circumstances that have affected this, this family uh, and their challenge in meeting the cost of living. The real world that we're living in and that the government is committed to uh, working in uh, for the benefit of Canadians is one where this government will continue to make the investments necessary in, in, in Canadians, uh, in their households, in their families, uh, and in our industry and our economy uh, so that uh, we can continue uh, forward in a path towards a better future. As you can see, Justin Trudeau is completely out of touch. It's insane that he's spending forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a night on these little retreats, and yet Canadians are locked into this two x carbon tax, and it's just. It, it doesn't seem like he has his priorities in order. And speaking of not having his priorities in order, let's watch this next clip of the same Senator, Dom Plett, reaming into Trudeau over Indigenous rights. Senator Plett. Colleagues, I rise today to speak to second reading of Bill S-13, an act to amend the Interpretation Act and to make related amendments to other acts. It has been a few months since Senator Levick and Benson spoke to this legislation on June 20th. So allow me to provide you with a bit of an overview to refresh your memory. Bill S-13 will first of all amend the Interpretation Act to include a non-derogation clause on upholding the Aboriginal and treaty rights found in Section 35 of the Constitution Act, 1982. That clause will read as follows. Every enactment is to be construed as upholding the Aboriginal and treaty rights of Indigenous peoples, recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982, and not as abrogating or derogating from them. In addition to establishing a blanket non-derogation clause, Bill S-13 will remove the existing non-derogation clauses from 26 different pieces of legislation. Only three existing laws with non-derogation clauses will retain those NDCs. On the surface, the government's rationale for this legislation, by and large, is solid. First of all, it will provide a uniform standard for the interpretation of all federal legislation by including a blanket non-derogation clause in the Interpretation Act. All federal laws will be read as including an NDC. Secondly, it will create a standardized non-derogation clause. NDCs have been added to legislation in an ad hoc manner for decades. They first began to show up in a small number of federal laws in the 1970s and early 1980s although at that time they obviously did not reference the Constitution Act 1982. After the patriation of the Constitution Act and the adoption of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms of 1982, NDCs once again started to be included in federal legislation in 1986. Over the years, the wording of these NDCs has changed. And while nobody has advocated that NDCs should be used to either extend or diminish existing rights, the arguments have gone back and forth regarding whether that might be the real world outcome. For example, when the Senate Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs studied this issue between 2003 and 2007, they noted in their report that, they, and I quote, heard significantly divergent testimony from government and non-government witnesses with respect to the purpose and effect of non-derogation clauses. 
Indigenous groups saw the inclusion of NDCs, and again, I quote, as a minimum stipulation that the law should be interpreted so as not to negatively affect their constitutional, Aboriginal, and treaty rights. On the other hand, justice officials, and again, I quote, considered these clauses largely superfluous reminders of Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982. The committee noted that the wording of the NDCs began to be changed. Indigenous groups became concerned that because of the lack of consistency in the wording, the courts would or could attribute different interpretations to differently worded non-derogation clauses in order to make sense of the differences in various statutes. As a result of this testimony, the Senate Legal Committee recommended that the government introduce a standardized non-derogation clause, which is what Bill S-13 will do. The third component of the government's rationale for this bill is that amending the Interpretation Act to include a blanket NDC will remove the need for Indigenous peoples to press for NDCs whenever the government introduces legislation. There are clear advantages to this. However, I would note there is also a counter-argument for what has been called continual reiteration of non-derogation clauses rather than utilizing a single statement. Since the non-derogation clause primarily serves as a reminder of existing rights and does not confer any new rights, repeating a standardized non-derogation in every piece of legislation may be more effective than, the, than a single iteration, which is soon out of sight and out of mind. The fourth part of the government's rationale is that including an NDC in the Interpretation Act helps fulfill an obligation under the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which requires that measures be taken to ensure the consistency of laws with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Colleagues, in principle, I believe that we can all support these objectives. As noted in both 2007 Senate report and the government's 2022 What We Learned report, Indigenous peoples have been asking that the Federal Interpretation Act be amended to include an NDC for many years. However, rather than being celebrated, it is my view that this legislation should be recognized for what it is, an acknowledgement of the repeated and systemic failure of Canadian governments to honour Aboriginal and treaty rights. How else do we explain such a bill? First, we had the treaties. Then the treaties were followed by court decisions which insisted those treaties must be honoured. Then we introduced the Charter of Rights which affirmed that treaty rights are actual rights and must be respected. Following that, Parliament adopted the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, which requires that, and I quote, states shall consult and cooperate in good faith with the Indigenous peoples concerned through their own representative institutions in order to obtain their free prior and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislation or administrative measures that may affect them. And yet, in spite of all these measures, we somehow still need a blanket non-derogation clause. I can't help but think that if the Government of Canada simply started honouring Aboriginal and treaty rights we would no longer need to repeatedly layer statutory declarations on top of each other to try and compel the government to do what it agreed to do in the first place. Do not misunderstand me. I do not blame our Indigenous peoples for wanting this non-derogation clause. I blame the government that it is needed at all. I support this bill in principle, but I am not convinced that a fifth 
for a greater certainty layer is going to provide any more certainty to indigenous peoples than the previous four layers. Let me illustrate my concern with a simple example. Right now, the Senate Standing Committee on National Security and Defense and Veterans Affairs is studying Bill C-21, an act to amend certain acts and to make certain consequential amendments, firearms, otherwise known as the Gun Control Bill. This legislation will enact significant changes which will have serious detrimental impacts on law-abiding gun owners in Canada, including on the treaty rights of Indigenous peoples. Yet in spite of this, the government completely failed to consult with Indigenous peoples and is instead charging ahead. I noted this in my speech on C-21 when I mentioned that the question, with whom did you consult, was posed to the officials during my critics' briefing on the bill. When the officials were asked to describe their process of consulting with Indigenous peoples, they turned and looked for answers to the representative who was from Minister Mendocino's office. Departmental officials did say they had consulted on the previous bill, Bill C-21, which died on the order paper. But they engaged no such consultation with Indigenous peoples in advance of introducing this bill, which has different provisions from the previous bill. Subsequent to my pre critics' briefing, officials sent my office a list of meetings they held with Indigenous groups after the bill was introduced. In other words, those were meetings held between January and May of this year. But that, colleagues, was months after Bill C-21 had been introduced and only occurred after the public opposition, opposition to the government's amendments had arisen. As on so many other occasions, Indigenous peoples were only an afterthought. That makes a mockery out of the claim that when it comes to Indigenous peoples, it is nothing about us without us. Even though Indigenous peoples have treaty rights, and even though the courts have upheld these rights, and even though the Charter affirms these rights, and even though UNDRA passed by Parliament compels the government to consult with Indigenous peoples in order to obtain their free, prior, and informed consent before adopting and implementing legislation or administrative measures that may affect them. Yet, in spite of all of these measures, the government is still failing to consult and respect Indigenous rights. So now we have Bill S-13 in front of us, which says that Bill, says that Bill C-21 should be, and I quote, construed as upholding the Aboriginal and treaty rights of Indigenous peoples, recognized and affirmed by Section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982, and not as abrogating or derogating from them. And yet, Bill C-21 does nothing of the sort. We may as well pass a law which says, plumbers should be construed as lawyers. I think they'd make better lawyers. Saying it is so does not make it so. Colleagues, I support the intent of this legislation, but I question the value that it will bring when we have a government that has repeatedly demonstrated that it will flout the law whenever that might be to its advantage. I hope that this legislation will be very carefully studied at committee to ensure that it has the support of Indigenous peoples that the government claims it does, and that it will achieve the objectives that it is designed to achieve. Thank you.
thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. If you want to support the channel financially, you can do so by checking out the merch shop linked right up there. Or if you want to do something for free, which is also absolutely acceptable and highly encouraged, you can subscribe right there. If you want to continue watching videos like this, you can do so by clicking or tapping right there to watch the next upcoming video. And if you want to watch a little bit of different content, but also Canadian stuff, you can do so by clicking right up there. That's my second channel, House of Canada, also known as the House of Commons highlights. Thanks so much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.